Kaplan. We are delighted to meet you again. Maybe some of you remember, I think it was on the last 20th of October, we were here at the hotel. The hotel had not even reopened to the public. We felt that we were in a speakeasy. We were making all kinds of promises. There was Sébastien Bazin, who was very enthusiastic. Fabrice Collet, who was very humble because of this crisis we were going through, and we were delighted to meet on that day. And a few days later, it was the lockdown, the autumn lockdown, and it started all over again. So we are happy to go back into a more conventional meeting system. Today, we're going to answer some important questions for you, for us, for the whole sector. We are going to talk about the economic context. We'll talk about this uh, just in a few minutes. The macro situation. We'll also talk about human resources, which is a very important topic. The human beings are very important, are key in our sector, and there's a lot of tension. We need to understand the roots, um, why this tension, how, how we can find a solution to this issue. And we will talk about communication, how we communicate during this time period. The old historical concepts, how they're going to change age, experience. We have to keep renewing ourselves. We have to look at all the new concepts. So I'm not going to take too long this morning in my welcome speech. I'm not going to do anything formal. But uh, we're really delighted to see you all. The team has worked very hard. There is going to be some live streaming in English and in French. In English will be on Twitter, and the French will be on YouTube if it works. Is it working, Claire? No, it's not working. Well, it doesn't matter. This is the digital world. But don't worry, everything will be recorded. And without further ado, I would like to invite you to warmly welcome somebody whom I really respect. You probably heard about him, a lot of uh, respect because he's very good. Um, I'm not saying that. It's the Bloomberg classification who says that it's uh, the best forecaster in the world. And maybe, and maybe we have a better forecaster uh, who is French. So please welcome Christophe Barrault who's going to shed some light over the sector. And over 30% uh, of days in the office uh, will go away. Business travel has not returned. So are, are you expecting that to not return? Are you changing the strategy here? With respect to business and group travel, I continue to be very optimistic about it. And I think the core fundamental uh, backdrop for that is in the same way that people have found amazing fulfillment in going away on holidays with family, friends, loved ones. And it's really given them tremendous inspiration and, and, uh, and optimism for the future. The same is true for business travel. I think that um, if this, if, if our, our IPO represents anything, I think it represents that our hosts are coming back and that travel's coming back. And believe me, if you're standing, I recommend you sit down. Up eight tenths of 1% on headline, four times expectations, and the numbers are out. Headline up 0.5 exactly as expected. Do remember, the up 0.9 that we had was the highest going back, well, 13 years. The question is, is do we go back to where we were pre-COVID with consumer prices printing 1% to 2%, or do we have, for a period of time, a higher plateau? Is it three to four percent instead? Quelle perspective économique à moyen terme 2021-2022? Présenté par Christophe Bar. The economic outlooks in the midterm 2021-2022. So we are going to give you the context in case you switched off your TV during this COVID period. Christoph, what will the future look like? Good morning, everybody. Today, the objective it was to talk about the overall situation, to look at what happened last summer. What is most important is to always look at where we've come from and where we stand today. 
Otherwise, it's always more difficult to forecast. So the objective today will be to talk about the current situation, go back on last summer, and then we will look at what's going to happen at the end of the year and potentially in 2022. Although considering the context, it's always very difficult to make any forecasts. So I'll try to give you an overall picture, but I will focus on the three areas that I know of best, that is China, the United States, and Europe. So for 2021, the context is rather positive. The global activity will recover around 6% if we look at the growth figures slightly under 6%, but a significant rebound after a contraction of 3% last year, the greatest for, fall since World War II. So the growth peak is behind us. It was in the third quarter because there was a significant rebound of growth in India and what is positive to a European growth that is going to accelerate. But the growth peak is slightly under what we expected because there were two phenomena in the third quarter. The first was a significant slowdown in China and in the United States also. So in China, and this is what's most important today, and this is the greatest surprise, is that there were all kinds of parameters weighing negatively on business. The first is, of course, the health situation. There's a resurgence of COVID cases from mid-July onwards. Authorities decided to implement a tolerance zero uh, system, so there were local lockdowns and a weakness in the business, especially at the end of July and lately in the past two weeks of September. One statistic that I really like, which never lies, is the number of flights in China, because nobody flies with empty aircraft to boost statistics. So we do see that in this graph. The first point is a resurgence of the number of COVID cases, and then you have another parameter which is also negative, which is related to energy. And that is the current situation. China has decided to implement drastic environmental rules to reduce its CO2 emissions. So in certain key sectors, as you can see on the left graph, the production of steel is going down. And you have another issue weighing on growth that is all that is related to the real estate market. You must have heard about that recently with Evergrande, which is a consequence of the macroeconomic policy in China because real estate in China really developed last August. There were a lot of OT2 measures real estate prices went up. I and mean, with the local lockdowns, there was a shock in the real estate market. There was a significant slowdown in real estate sales. That's the right-hand side graph. And what weighs on Chinese growth is that. So in the third quarter, we can have a figure close to zero in China. And this will be the lowest since Q1 2020. Now, let's go on to the United States. In the United States, there was also a negative surprise in Q3. And this can be explained by three parameters. The first parameter is that since there's a resurgence in the number of COVID cases in China, which lasted from July to August, today we can believe that the peak is behind us. And that's rather a good piece of news. And this means an acceleration in Q4. But in Q3, there's this COVID phenomenon. There is this um, tax support to households, which was slightly lower. You had all the um, aid, state aid for the non-working population, and there was inflation. And so you can see it here on this graph. Here you can see the conditions under which they'll buy consumables and the new vehicles and real estate. So these are the worst levels for decades now. And this explains why we had the slowdown in the United States. And the United States is just passing. There can be uh, rebound in Q4. 
because of the health situation. Now, what is positive in Q3 globally is that Europe is an exception. We should have a greater growth. This can be explained by several things. First, because uh, uh, the rebound took place later than the United States, and you have a good uh, control of the epidemic, which is due to two factors. First, vaccination. The European countries are ahead of the United States or other countries in Asia, whereas we were lagging behind at the beginning. So we really caught up. And you had uh, climate conditions that were highly favorable, the humidity rate, pollution, etc. So this allowed a good control of the epidemic. And now you have all kinds of indicators, pre-COVID indicators, for example, road traffic in certain capitals. and you have some encouraging real estate signs. And I'm going to give you back the floor at this moment. So if we can see the slide. So the whole topic, we have a greater normality in our business with contrast. Let's go back to hospitality. These are our figures. And here in this graph, you see that the average of the prior cycle between 2009 and 2019 in terms of occupancy rate and demand. You see this little red curve in the center that is 2021, the pinkish curve that is 2020. And you see a normalization or back to normal in our activities. So it's highly contrasted, but we're going in the right direction. And it'll be interesting to see whether you confirm this um, economic outlook. So as for the outlooks, well, let's be frank, it's very difficult to make forecasts a year before, specifically now. To give a figure for 2022, I think this is a, almost impossible globally or per geographical zone. But we can try to give you a range. And what you need to understand are the risks associated to this range. So the consensus is around four and a half globally next year. And I think it will be closer to four. And the risks associated are rather going to go down. I wanted to stress a certain number of risks because, of course, you have the health risks, especially in China, because their policy is a zero tolerance policy because they want to maintain a proper framework before the Olympic Games. And there could be some lockdowns and some drops in the figures in China. But there are two parameters that will persist. That is the soaring of the threat indices that will continue let's say, until mid-November or so, just before Christmas, therefore. And so there is a negative impact on the corporate margins. And then you have the price of raw material that is going up, that is soaring. And if you discuss with most of the CEOs, today they are confident. They think that the consumers can pay for this. So you will have inflation everywhere. When you say inflation, that means there will be a growth in the real consumption that will be impacted in Q4. And then, of course, it's always very difficult to forecast things. Things should get normal at the beginning of 2022. Things should be more favorable, but we still need to keep a keen eye on all this. And the other parameters that we need to take into account, this is all that can be related to semiconductors. Semiconductors, well, this isn't new. This exists since mid-2020. But there's a real impact today, and especially in the automotive sector. Why in the automotive sector? Because um, there are a lot more semiconductors in vehicles now. In 2000, we were at around 18%, and now we are at 40%. And when there's a shortage, whether it's in Europe, in China, etc., well, you have 
production problems. So you hardly have any stocks in the United States. The stocks are at their lowest historically. If you want um, the state-of-the-art car, you need to wait for eight months or a year to get it. And the direct consequence is the drop in the sales of vehicles in the world after the peak we had last year. So there is pressure in the automotive sector. And we don't find bicycles either. That's really paradoxical. No cars, no uh, bicycles, no scooters. Uh, and at Nike, no sneakers. And so that would be very hard for Christmas. So that's an excuse not to do any sports. So that's perfect, says Mr. Vangelis. And now there are other risks, political, there are uncertainties. I'm going to mention a few of them. You have to find a coalition in Germany. There will be legislative elections in Japan. There is the increase of the debt ceiling in the United States. In 2020, you know what's going to happen in France, although the results are uncertain, the elections in France, and you have the midterm elections in the United States. So a lot of uncertainties, and from the geopolitical point of view, maybe this is what, what's most topical. There's going to be a huge increase in energy prices, which can weigh on the purchasing power of households. Gas prices will go up 12.6% by Friday. That's 3 million people will be affected in France. And now, the central theme for economists and market professionals is to normalize the monetary policies in 2022. You can see it on this graph, which is the combined um, results of uh, the central banks and the G7. So you can see what happened during the COVID. And here, the results increased by $11 trillion since February. So this clearly shows the accommodating policy of the monetary policies. And the difficulty next year will be to slow down the purchasing of assets and to increase the interest rates in certain areas. So this will be a challenge in the UK. But the main challenge, what everybody will be looking at, will be what's going to happen in the United States. And for me, my hypothesis in the past six months is that the race will go up in 2022. This has been confirmed by two parameters, which is the job market. If you look at what's happening in terms of supply and demand, there's more supply than demand, offer than demand. And this is quite atypical on the American market. And in this context, you can imagine that we would have to pursue the increase of salaries. So this will be a source of inflation over the midterm. And the main point, which has been minimized, and I wanted to focus on this, was the evolution of the rents in the United States. And when you look at what's happening and the data we've obtained for August, whatever the provider, we had increases of above 10% in August. and. We received the statistics yesterday. The index was slightly higher. It was 12, and here we have 15 annually. The difference in the US is that the rents are not capped. That's the difference with Europe. So there's a real risk of inflation, and the rents are 33% of um, the consumer price index. And so from the monetary policy point of view, things can be a bit more restrictive. So for me, the risk will be rather lower with contrasted outlooks. I know that you're more optimistic, and that is normal in a sector where we need to catch up. Well, yes, indeed. One of the first questions we can put is that, will we have Chinese clients again? As per what you were saying, we're not sure that by the end of the year or by 2022, we'll have the same flows as what we used to have for all kinds of reasons, economic and political. And here you have a map representing the hotel revenue. And this is the share of the Chinese clients. Of course, some are more exposed and others are less exposed. So it's roughly 3 to 4 percent. 3 to 4 percent is quite a lot, but it's not the end of the world. And if you look at what happened in 1999, 
Here you have the euro dollar parity, which is the blue curve, and the red curve, that's the number of nights spent by the American clients. Why is it interesting to look at this? You have the 11th of September in 2001 when there was the explosion of the internet bubble. So these were the major clients and they all of a sudden stopped traveling. They were afraid of flying. There was a complex economic crisis too. And we clearly see in 2014 the inflection point, the parity euro dollar went down and we have the return of American clients in terms of hotel nights. So this is uh, interesting and this is um, something that will become more normal. And if we look at the same time what happened, you have the occupation rates at the top. So in the years 2000, the top of the range in Paris account was 74.5% occupancy rate. And 2003, during the crisis, we were at 60. There was a contraction of the demand. And in 2018, I think, we were at 80% occupancy rate. Now, what happened in the meantime? So the American clients stopped coming. Brazil, the Middle East, China, the Brits, Russia, they started traveling massively. And then there was a return of the Americans in 2012, 2013. So there was a push effect. And in this interval, in these three years, there were 60,000 Airbnb rooms in Paris. So in Paris, we were close to 80% frequency rate. So will we see a reduction of this demand? Well, I would say yes, this could create anxiety, but the crisis has proved that there are other relays of demand. And Adrian will show it. There's leisure. There are all kinds of other relays of demand. So should you be excessively optimistic or excessively pessimistic? I think there's a nuance between the two. We could be preoccupied, but we could be reassured too. Now, the major question, which is the question regarding inflation, and I really like this question, I think that there are a lot of uh, discussions on this, and it won't be a good answer to a good issue. We tried to describe this graph. We wanted to have one slide, but we have to understand quite a number of things here. So it is not an answer to the question, but I'd like you, I'd like to invite you to look at the scale. Here we're in France in 1983, and if you look at 1983 and 19. 92, 91 crisis in the United States, 1993 crisis in France, you have an inflation of 3.6% during that period. And what do we observe? We observe an increase in the offer by 3%, 2.8% on an annual average, and you have a drop in the average price. The first question is, was this tragic for our sector? Well, no, not especially so. It was industrialization, chain hotels in uh, hospitality in France. It was a very mature market, very developed market in France with Accor, Louvre Hotel, B&B &B in economic hospitality. And it's a time period when the occupancy rate, the demand was a driver for the growth in the REVPAR. And in 91, during the crisis, the offer, which is in black, the black bars, remained flat. We didn't really develop a net offer on the market. And here we had 3.8 in the years 2000. There was an inflation of the average prices. And from that time onwards, it's the average prices that was a real driver. And it was a created a growth in the ref par. So the periods where we have inflation are good for the development of the offer. We know well, how this development took place. It restructured the market. It restructured the hotels with certain concepts. And if there is inflation, we will have a decade of development, new developments with new products. We'll talk about this today. will be hybrid. 
what will be the nature of these new projects? We'll talk about this later on. And as for inflation, Christoph, what is your feeling off record since we're amongst ourselves, we're in our bunker here? Well, I think there are three types of inflation. There's the transient inflation that affects all the sectors where we reopened, and that's going to dissipate. There is a transient inflation with the FEK, which is rated to semiconductors, the automotive sector, which will last much longer than planned. It will become normal again, but it will leave some effects. And inflation, which will be sustainable and it is underestimated, it is more visible in the United States with the rents. There are all kinds of structural factors. We could talk about this for an hour or so. And this is going to last, I think. But as for the surprise effect, I think that people are still a bit too conservative about their visions on inflation. And I think during the next six to nine months, there still will be an increase in inflation. Very well. Well, are there any questions from the audience? You have an oracle here, a visionary. No, no questions. So thank you, Christophe. Thank you for your analysis.